Good morning, Homeside. Good morning. You see, I'm coming here for the first time, so you want me to come back next time, right? So, I'm going to say it again. Good morning, Homeside. Good morning. All right. You can look out for my pastor, Alvin. Yes. This morning, our reading response is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 through 10. We will read responsibly. Can we stand? And it's in your bulletin on the back of the last sheet. Are we ready? Yes. Okay. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly there will, I rather the glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me.
like that. Yay. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. Good morning. It is good to be with you. And let's just have another word of prayer as we uh, have our sermon, open our sermon. Father in heaven, we praise you. We thank you for your goodness. I pray that your Holy Spirit will come into our hearts right now in a very powerful way, a very meaningful way. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 82-year-old Louise from Brazil was an Alzheimer's patient, and he was in the back of an ambulance, apparently going to the hospital, and he fell out of the ambulance. He worked the door open somehow, and the car behind him hit him and killed him. Maybe the most miraculous part, or not a miraculous, but amazing part of this story is that the ambulance driver didn't know he fell out until he had driven for seven miles. Not only that, uh, this man's uh, daughter-in-law was in the back of the ambulance watching over him, and she dozed off. And so nobody knew what happened for seven miles. Now my microphone's just gone out, hasn't it? Want me to use this one? And then you'll charge this one up for me, uh, apparently. Okay, can you hear me now if I use this one? One of the, uh, there's many problems with Alzheimer's patients and with Alzheimer's disease, but one of the uh, most outstanding problems with Alzheimer's, the outstanding characteristic, is its uh, effect on the short-term and long-term memory of its patients. Structural changes happen within the brain and the fibers of the brain. They get all tangled together. Now, what's very interesting is, did you know that some of the Bible characters have spiritual Alzheimer's as well? We're going to read about that in Romans chapter 4. So let's go to Romans chapter 4 and uh, see what some of these spiritual Alzheimer's and what this means. Has anybody ever heard of spiritual Alzheimer's in the Bible? Okay, well, let's read about that. We're going to start with Abraham in Romans chapter 4, and let's begin with verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now the first thing I want to point out here is that Abraham became righteous not through his own works, but through his belief in Jesus Christ. Jesus was perfect, Abraham was imperfect, Abraham became perfect by believing in Jesus. And so the first thing I want to point out here is nobody in this audience, including myself, is going to become perfect in and of their own. The only way you're going to find entrance into heaven is through Jesus Christ. However, as we read this story of Abraham, some very interesting thoughts come to mind. And the first thought is the writer of Romans, which was Paul, seems to have forgotten a few things about Abraham. He got spiritual Alzheimer's. And by the end of the sermon, I hope you'll understand that you need spiritual Alzheimer's as well. And so let's skip down a few verses to verse 19. And this is Paul's commentary about Abraham. It says, Be not weak in faith, and he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was also able to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now this is a very interesting set of verses. I want you to remember what Paul said about Abraham here. He was strong in faith. He didn't stagger at the promises of God. He was fully persuaded that what God said, he was able to perform. Amen? Amen. However, 
the writer seems to have forgotten a few things. Now, I was raised, in, born and raised in a Roman Catholic church uh, a family, and we went to church every Sunday. We never took our Bibles to church. Not once on Sunday services did we take our Bibles. We always listened to the priest, and that's where we got our spiritual fulfillment. I was completely ignorant to the Bible when I became a born-again Christian when I was about 24 years old. Now, when I began to read my Bible, I read what Paul had to say about Abraham here, and I was blown away. I was like, wow, I want to be like this spiritual giant. And then I read in Genesis about Abraham, Genesis 15 and 16 and 20 and 21, and I saw a big discrepancy between that Abraham and the New Testament Abraham. Does anybody know what I'm referring to here? I'll show you in just a minute here. And so as a new Christian, not knowing my Bible, I concluded there was two Abrahams in the Bible. There was the Old Testament one and the New Testament one. The Old Testament one, he made a lot of mistakes and he was very sinful. The New Testament one, we just read about here in Romans 4, he was a strong man of faith and he knew how to please God. Guess what? I was wrong. They are one and the same. How can that be? Well, let's go back into the book of Genesis and try to understand what confusion I had as a new Christian. So let's begin in Genesis, let's see here, let me look at my notes here. I'm using, uh, I asked for a, a lapel mic, but I couldn't Mommy. get one because it messed up our thing. So let me go back to this microphone. Mommy. Are we okay? No, we're not okay. Yes. Oh yes, we are okay here. All right, so let's go back to uh, Genesis, and let's start in Genesis 15. Genesis 15, starting with verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing that I go childless? And the servant of my house, is this Eleazar of Damascus? Now, you may not understand this from this verse, but what Abraham is saying here is that I go childless, and I am really an old man right now. Should I have Eleazar sire my child? Because I'm too old to have a child, my wife is too old, and so shall we use Eleazar? Well, here is uh, God's response to that with verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to Abraham, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he shall come forth out of your own body shall be thine heir. And so God made it very clear to Abraham, You don't have to help me, Abraham. I am plenty able to help myself because I am God. Amen. Amen. And so Abraham said, But God... I'm too old, Sarah's too old, don't you need a little help? I want to tell you right up front here, folks, God don't need your help, amen? God is well able to work any miracle in any person he well chooses to. You know, I can tell you a story about a church. I won't mention the church's name because I don't want to disparage anybody. But there's a one church that talks about the Red Sea crossing. You know how the children of Israel miraculously went through the Red Sea? Moses parted it with his rod. Well, this church says it was not the Red Sea. That was too big of a sea. That would be too much. It was the Reed Seed. And that means it was a swamp and there was reeds and cattails growing over this swamp. It had about 12 inches of water. There was this natural wind that went down, blew the water out, dried it up. The children of Israel escaped from the Egyptians. Well, if that's true, it's more miraculous than the Bible because 12 inches of water drowned the Egyptians. <laughs> no, folks, we don't need to help God. God is well able to help himself. And so this is what Abraham is doing here. He's trying to help God, and God says, no, I don't need the help. 
you're going to have a child out of your own body. Well, what did Abraham do? Well, look at verse 6. And Abraham believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And so Abraham, he got to that point. I'm old. My wife is old. But you know what? I'm going to believe God. I'm going to have faith in what God says. He's well able to do it. And because he had that faith, God honored that faith, and he became righteous through that faith. But guess what happened? Ten years went by. Fifteen years went by. And still no children. And we know that in today's world, don't we? I have lots of family and friends who don't have children because they're barren. One of them or both of them can't have children. And so what did Abraham and his wife Sarai do about this? Well, let's skip over to chapter 16. And let's start with verse 1. Chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was what, folks? Hagar. Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Now, folks, I want to tell you something right up front here. This was a big mistake. It was a terrible mistake for him to hearken to the voice of his wife. And I'm going to tell you folks, don't hearken to the voice of your wife. Amen? Oh, wait, let me finish that sentence here. Let me finish that sentence. Don't hearken to the voice of your wife if she's speaking against the word of God. Amen? And so if she's speaking the word of God, you can hearken unto her. But Abram made a huge mistake here because just 15 years ago, God promised him air. As a matter of fact, God took him outside. He looked up in the sky and it wasn't polluted like Washington DC here. It was clear and he could see zillions of stars up there. And God said, you know what? That's what your seed is going to be like. You're going to, your seed's going to populate the whole world. Now, folks, I don't know if you realize this, but this unholy alliance between Abram and Hagar has caused so much consternation in this world for the last three or four thousand years. It is amazing. Do you realize all the suicide bombings that happen at the hand of extremist Muslims are a result of this unholy alliance? Do you realize that? Do you realize the Twin Towers of 2001 was a result of this unholy alliance between Hagar and Abram. How many of you realize that? Well, now you do, so everybody should be raising their hand right now. This unholy alliance, this disobedience to the word of God has caused more consternation, more problems, more war in this world than anything else. Folks, it would behoove us to obey the word of God and to have faith in the word of God, even though when it seems like his word is not coming to pass, even though he's allowing us, he's testing our faith for years and years, we ought to have faith in the word of God. What do you say? Amen. All right, so um, and they have this unholy alliance. His child grows up. And then God comes to him and says, no, you made a big mistake. You have to go into your own wife and you have to have children through her. And guess what, folks? It happens. Finally, Abram and Sarai, they get it together. And Abram has now changed his name to Abraham. And Sarai is now called Sarah. You know, names mean a lot. And God said, because you're becoming overcomers, because you're earning, uh, not earning, because you're learning faith, and because you're learning to lean on me, I'm now going to change your name. Now, Andy here, I sent my uh, bulletin information to Andy back here, and he responded, and he said, Dear Dan. I said, No, Andy, my name's not Dan, it's Daniel. You see, Dan in the Old Testament 
was a tribe that apostatized and went away from God. Don't none of you call me Dan, amen? I'm Daniel. Daniel means God is my judge. I'm not my own judge. God is my judge. And so God changes Abraham's name and Sarah's name. And in chapter 22, verse 1, ch uh, chapter 21, I'm sorry, chapter 21 and verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord said to Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abram a son in his old age. At the set time for which God had spoken to him. What time, folks? The set time. Folks, God has a set time for you and your life. No matter what the circumstance, God has a set time. In our human reasoning, the time is now. Or the time should be tomorrow or next week or next Thursday. No, folks. God doesn't think the way you think. Amen. Amen. God thinks differently. God has a set time. Verse 5, And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. How old, folks? A hundred. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all who hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah should give children suck? For I built, born him a son in his old age. I like that one. She laughed. Now, you know, she actually laughed at the beginning when God said to her she was going to have a child. She actually laughed in mockery. <laughs> it was like, oh, come on, God, that's never going to happen. That was a faithless laugh. Let none of us have a faithless laugh or a scornful laugh towards God. Amen? Amen. However, this laugh was a laughter of joy and happiness that here's this 90-year-old woman who had born a child. Now, most of us have seen 90-year-old women, maybe in a nursing home. My mother is 92 years old right now. And I want you to put in your imagination a 90-year-old woman or somebody around that age. Maybe they're a family or friend or somebody you know in the nursing home. Now, I want you to make them eight months pregnant. Would you laugh? <laughs> if I saw my mother at 92 years old, eight months pregnant, I think I might laugh a little bit. And so here's Sarai. She's laughing because she's now born the child of promise. And so they're finally learning what faith really is. They're finally depending on God. They're finally saying what God said I believe and what I believe settles it. That's all there is to it. This is good news, folks. Amen. Some of us have not learned faith yet. I must confess to you right now, I don't have the strong faith that God wants me to have. And maybe some of you can confess the very same thing. Uh, the good news is, if you're under 99 years old, there's still hope for you. Amen. And so God used Abraham in a very powerful way. But Abraham had to learn how to exercise faith in God. Abraham took his whole life to learn this. And God forbid that any of us should take that long. Now, God some, does something very interesting here. He not only does it to Abraham, but he does it to everybody who's in my hearing distance right now. God tests and tests and quizzes you. And God's going to see how much faith you have. So Abraham and Sarai finally, or Sarah finally came to the point where they had enough faith in God that they had this child of promise. So God said, Abraham, you've been a flunky up till now. You've been flunking these quizzes. You lied to the Egyptian Pharaoh. You did all kinds of things. And now I'm going to give you the final exam. This sister here said, pray for me. I've got a final exam this week, okay? Matter of fact, I'm in school right now as well. I've got a final exam next Thursday as well. You can pray for me as well as her as well. All right, so what does God do here? God says, Abram, here's your final exam. And you are not going to like 
this final exam. Chapter 21, verse 1. <clears throat> Sorry, 22. Chapter 22 and verse 1. It came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. What did God do to Abraham? Tested him. Every one of you will be tested by God many, many times in your life. Do you like it? No. <laughs> do I like it? No. No. None of us like to be tested. None of us. Are you looking forward to your test this week? Are you grateful and joyful and happy? No. Not at all. I'm not either. Nobody likes being tested. However, it is necessary for the purification of our souls. Amen? Amen? It is necessary that we go through trials and temptations and tests so that God can purify our souls and make us fit for the kingdom of heaven. Praise God for tests and trials and temptations. Verse 2, 22, verse 2. And God said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you of. I've been to Mount Moriah, I've been to Israel. I saw that mount. God said, here's your final quiz. This is the final exam. I want you to take your only son, this son, that you spent so many years praying for and agonizing over. Yeah. And I want you to take that only child of your loins, take him to Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice. And the Bible says it took three days for Abraham to travel from where he lived to Mount Moriah. I've got a question for you. If God told you to sacrifice your son and you knew it was God's voice and he gave you three days to think about it, would you agonize in those three days' time? In those three days' time, Abraham's thinking, how am I going to do this? Abraham is thinking in his mind, when I slit the poor boy's throat, he's going to writhe and slither all over that altar, the blood's going to come out. Now Abraham's seen a lot of blood because he was the priest of his household. He sacrificed a lot of lambs and rams. So he was very familiar with cutting a throat and seeing the blood gush out. But now, there was a new scenario. It was not going to be a dumb animal, it was going to be the child that he loved. He's got three days to think about it. What do you think? Hard? Have you been tested this difficult in your life? Little Isaac takes the wood on his own shoulders, on his own back, as they travel, the wood of sacrifice. Little Isaac is his only begotten son. Do you see parallels between Isaac and Jesus? Jesus took the wood of sacrifice on his own shoulder and took it up Mount Calvary. Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. Lots of parallels here. Lots of parallels. He's successful now. He does it. He gets up there. He lifts the knife up, about to strike, and then God says, don't do it. I know you love me more than anybody else, even your own son. How many of us can say that in this room? How many of us can say, I love God more than my car, my house, my husband, my wife, or my children? How many of us can honestly say that? So God says to Abraham, I know that you love me more than anything else in this world. You passed the final exam with 100%. You got an A plus, Abraham. Praise God. You see, what happened, folks, is these failures in Abraham's life were preparing him for success. 
Are you listening to me, my failed brothers and sisters? Have you failed? I know I failed God a million times in my Christian experience. And I've wanted to give up so many times. But I read stories like this, and it gives me hope and courage. And say, if God didn't give up on Abraham, he's not going to give up on me. He's not going to give up on you. Amen? Amen? God loves you too much. God has mercy for you and your sins. And God's going to provide that sacrificial animal. Now, I've got a question here. We've now compared the two Abrahams <laughs> that this Catholic boy saw in the Bible, the Old Testament Abraham and the New Testament one. And we now saw the Old Testament Abraham made all kinds of failures and mistakes and sins. The New Testament one was this perfect saint that Paul talks about. He didn't stagger at God's promises. He was faithful. He believed with all of his heart. Why did Paul seem to forget all of Abraham's failings and sins. Why? Because Paul had God's heart. What do I mean by that? Go to Hebrews. We're going to wind down now in our sermon. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to see why Paul forgot all of Abraham's failings. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds. I will write them. And their sins and iniquities will I do what, folks? I will remember no more. God has spiritual Alzheimer's. Praise God for that. God forgets our sins. God forgets our iniquities. God restores us and leads us to the ways of everlasting life. Don't give up, brothers and sisters. Now, I don't know most of you in this congregation very well at all, but I can, I know myself, and I'll tell you a little something about myself. There are kind of two ditches you fall in when you're a Christian. One ditch is pride and arrogant. You think I'm better than others because I'm a Christian. Well, that's not Christianity at all. The other ditch is that I'm not good enough, I'm sinful, and God doesn't love me and God won't accept me. Now, I've got a question for you. Which ditch does God love more? Neither one. God doesn't like any of those ditches. Well, I'm going to tell you a little something about myself. My tendency is to fall in the second ditch. My tendency is to think I'm too sinful, not good enough, and God doesn't love me. That, that's just my personality and my nature. If anybody else has that temptation, that ditch in their life, I want to present to you Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He died for your sin. And remember how Abraham was counted righteous? How was it, folks? By his works or by his faith in Jesus? Faith. It was by his faith in Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Glory. Hallelujah. It is not Daniel's works that's taken him to heaven. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy if it were my works. I need to go down there if it were my works. How about you? It is by the works of Jesus Christ that you're going to heaven. It's not by any works that you have done or that I have done. And so God says, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now let's go to the faith chapter. And I'm just about wrapped up here. And in the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, do you know what I call the faith chapter? Hebrews 11, I call it the Alzheimer's chapter. He talks about Abraham, Sarah, David, King David. Talks about Noah and Rahab. Folks, Noah was a drunk. David was in the most powerful political and religious position in Israel. 
when he committed adultery and murdered a man. Rahab was a harlot and she lied. And who was the third? Oh, Abraham and Sarai. They made so many mistakes. You know, Abraham lied about Sarah being his wife two times. <laughs> Guess what happens in Hebrews chapter 11? In Hebrews chapter 11, they are called men and women of strong faith. None of their sins, none of their iniquities are pointed out here. How does this happen? Well, it's explained how it happens in verse 34. Hebrews 11 verse 34 is our closing verse. They quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword out of weakness. What happened, folks? They were made strong. Do you see your weakness? If you do, praise God. Because as you recognize your weakness, you are made strong. How does that work? Is this just theology or does this really work? Let me give you an example in my own life. In my BC years, that is before Christ came into my heart, I used marijuana and I got addicted to it for my teen years until I was about 24 years old. God gave me a miraculous deliverance, praise his name, and I've not smoked marijuana since I was 24 years old. You can tell that was not very many years ago by how young I look, right? Okay, well, anyway, he gave me that deliverance the first year or two. After I quit smoking marijuana, I had to be really careful and avoid some of my family and friends who used marijuana. I couldn't be around them, especially when they were smoking. Why? Because I knew what my weakness was, right? You see, Hebrews 11 says, not the strong, not the saint, but the weak. It was through my weakness, recognizing my weakness, that I became strong. Amen? Recognizing my weakness for marijuana, I became strong. If God only saved the strong, he couldn't show himself miraculous. God wants to use people like you and me who are weak. Now, if you're self-righteous, I'm not speaking to you. But if you're weak and you see your need of God, then he's speaking to you Amen. and he's appealing to you. Take your weakness and combine it with God's strength. That's what Abraham did. Abraham took his foolishness and combined it with God's wisdom. Abraham took his emptiness and combined it with God's fullness and received the fullness of the Holy Ghost. Closing illustration. As was mentioned, I lived in New Zealand for the past 10 years. And we lived next to a cow farm, a, a, a dairy farmer. He had a lot of cows on his farm, hundreds of acres, I guess. And I used to walk through his uh, paddocks every day for exercise. I'm a bit into exercise and health and fitness. And so I'd walk through his paddocks every day. One day I was going over a brow of a hill and I saw a cow with a newborn calf. It was a beautiful, cute newborn calf, about five hours old. It was born that night. And it was so darling. I thought to myself, I want to go pet it and talk to it and get to know it and that type of thing. It was a black and white spotted calf, beautiful calf. And so I started walking up to it. Well, it was sleeping, and its mother was eating grass. And as soon as this little calf saw or heard me coming, it sprang to its wobbly legs. Its tail went straight up in the air. That's a warning or a caution sign. And then it pressed close to its mother. Well, its mother knew something was wrong, so she stopped eating grass. And she looked at me, and she looked at her calf, and she saw my intention, and she said, go ahead, buddy, try it, and you'll have to contend with me. Now, she didn't actually say that, but that's what she said in her eyes. I took a wide berth 
around them and went home. That calf knew two things that I've been trying to teach you this morning. Number one, that calf knew it was weak. And number two, that calf knew where its strength came from. Do you know that you're weak? Secondly, do you know where your strength comes from? That 90 pound calf became worth 1,200 pounds. That 90 pound wobbly legged calf became the strongest cow in that pasture. For a mother's wrath knows no end. Some of you have seen your weakness and your ineffectiveness and your inefficiency in God's work. God's calling you to get close to Jesus Christ. Jesus is strong. You're weak. Jesus is powerful. You're impotent. Jesus can do it. You can't do it. Jesus is calling you to draw close to him. To recognize your weakness. Some of you, I don't know this congregation. I'm just brand new here. So I'm just going to take a shot with the Holy Spirit here. And say some of you haven't made that surrender yet. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Some of you haven't been baptized, you haven't surrendered to Jesus. You know, baptism is a symbol of what I've been preaching about. Baptism is a symbol of surrendering your weakness to God's strength. Baptism is a symbol of being cleansed of all that garbage from your past and having a clean life with Jesus right now and in your future. And there may be some here who have not made that Surrender. Haven't been baptized in Jesus. And I'm talking about a biblical baptism. Do you know what a biblical baptism is? It's full water immersion. Sprinkling doesn't do it. Sprinkling just sprinkles the dust off. Baptism washes the whole body and soul. Amen. And so there may be one or two of you who want to consider baptism. And I'm going to ask you if you want to consider that to make a stand for Jesus right now. Now, we're not going to baptize you today. And maybe sometime in the future, the next few weeks or months, you want to consider being baptized. And if that's your desire, sometime in the future, if you'd like to consider making this surrender to God, consider being baptized, would you just stand to your feet right now and say, Daniel, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me today. And I know that I want to make that decision. Is there anybody in this room today who wants to stand to their feet and make that decision? Okay, well let's go to our offertory. Is that right? We do our offering now? Yes. Okay, I don't know who calls for that, but I'll invite you up, brother. This song that I'm about to sing is a song that I have been singing for at least 12 years. But it means so much, so much to me because I've seen God taking me from one place to another. And it's just because of His loving, caring hands that He has used. So help me. Say thanks to God today for what He has done for us. Life can be so good. Life can be so hard. Never knowing what each day
surrender to you. I pray you'll speak to their hearts. Show them your love, your kindness, your mercy, and your forgiveness. <laughs> Father, be with us now as we go to the rest of our day. Help us to enjoy the rest of our Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.